We're going to jump right into this. Galatians chapter number 5. We're reviewing real quickly. We're two-thirds of the way through our fruit salad in uh, Teen Church. And there are nine fruit of the Spirit. And uh, let's see if you guys remember this. This is only adults now. We'll get to the teenagers later because it wouldn't be fair for you adults who haven't been in our teen service the last three weeks. But uh, love, joy, peace, these three we say are kind of upward decisions we need to make of expressing our love, our joy, and peace with God. All right? And we are equating different fruit with this, hopefully to be a reminder for us. Does anybody remember when we reviewed the first time what we equated with love? What fruit did we equate with love? Any takers here? Yes, sir, Keith? Are you asking me or telling me? What kind of student are you? Listen, it's an apple. That's right. Thank you, Miss Pat. She affirmed. All right, I have a first here, second by Miss Pat. All right, put it in the books. Uh, yes, apple, the apple of love. An apple is literally part of the Rose family as well, and so that's where we put those two together. Apples are loved by everybody. Everybody loves apple pie, apple fritters, apple turnovers, apple cider, apple cider. There's so much apple out there. So when we see apple, think, is the love of God, is the love of God, is the love of God. And so with that love of God, we told everyone that there's a love for God, a love for unbelievers, and a love for the brethren. Then the second one, this is when we did preach in here, or, or uh, this was Megan helping me. Uh, she remembered this, but we talked about the word joy. So love, apple, joy. Is any adult in here remember joy? Uh, Mitchell, the banana, that's right. And when we review with our teenagers, they go, banana, like that little kid who said it in that little video we saw. The banana of joy. Put a banana under your nose, it makes a smile. Uh, hold it up sideways, it's a J. There's so much we can equate. When I see a banana, when I see a cluster of a bunch of bananas, things like that, am I thinking joy, 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 joy. And uh, we need to have joy, of course, Jesus, others, and you the acronym for joy that we've known of. So we associate an apple with love, a banana with joy, and then peace. That's what I preached on last time I was here on a Wednesday. Remember what fruit we used for peace? Yes, Miss Marie? An orange, that's right. Now there's other great uh, features of the vitamin C and the help and the supplements we get from an orange. But we said the unique part about it is you eat an orange piece by piece, right? You have to peel it back and take one of them pieces out and eat it. It's rare that you just bite right into that sucker bill and eat away, all right? So we said, peace, peace, peace. And then we preached on that and said, we need to have peace with God, peace with one another, peace with the world, and of course, that peace, peace within. And then now we'll go to the teenagers. Adults, you can play if you want, but hopefully the teenagers will remember this. Then we got love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Long-suffering, or, or patience is another word akin to that, but long-suffering, the ability to wait for a long time, right? We applied long-suffering, you adults, now that we uh, kind of help uh, arrange things at Christmas and get things ready for the kids and the family, but you remember when you were a kid, you had to experience long-suffering, right? When can we open presents, right? And so that long-suffering is a trait that all of us as Christians have. As teenagers, what fruit did we associate with long-suffering? Ash? The pineapple. The pineapple takes up to three years for full maturation before they pluck it off the plant and serve it to us to eat. You know what those planters need? Long-suffering. And so when we taught on long-suffering, we taught about patience. We taught about the fact of patience with problems. Can I tell you they're going to come? This isn't a preacher, and our pastor is not the one. We don't preach. Once you trust Christ as your Savior, you'll never have a tough day in the rest of your life. We don't preach your greatest days are ahead. Yes, heaven is ahead. Yes, glory is ahead. But it doesn't come without rain. It rains on the just and the unjust. So we need to have patience in problems. We need to have patience with people. We need to have patience with the plan of God. We need to have patience with ourselves. And then we talked about the word gentleness. Gentleness. Uh, this is unique as we went through this, but gentle. Now, when I give you the definition that we gave to the teenagers church, maybe you'll agree with me, but what, what fruit do we put with gentleness? Who's got this one? Nathan, holler it out there, buddy. A coconut. A what? Again, coconut, part of the pear family, is a fruit it ain't no nut, okay? Now, we call it coconut, uh, but here's why it's, why it's associated with the word gentle. Listen to this. Gentleness 
by definition is this. In the word of the Bible, in Strong's Concordance, you break it down to its Greek word. Gentleness is this, a strong hand with a soft touch. A strong hand with a soft touch. And so when I think of that, the coconut is the toughest fruit to ultimately enjoy. You got to climb up a 30-foot tree to get one down. You got to use a machete to pull it off its branch. Then when you come down to the ground to slice that thing open properly, you need to be real careful with that machete that you don't lose liquid or a limb when you slice that top off. It's tough. You need to be gentle. A strong hand with a gentle touch. We taught on this. Listen to this. Gentleness means to understand someone else is weak and do your best to help them through their weakness so you have to be strong so you can help them. Come here, Austin, real quick. Come on up here, Austin, and, uh, and why don't you come up, Avery? I don't want to embarrass him. So here we go. This is, this is what the church looks like to you. The preacher needs to be strong spiritually. This preacher needs to walk with God so he can yoke up with Jesus, so he can take his yoke upon him because his burden is easy and his burden is light. So when Austin has a problem and he reaches up and says, I need help, he can say, all right, I'm here for you. Yeah, let's pray. And as soon as he does this, church member B comes up and says, hey, preacher, I need help. All right, here, all right, you stay right there, all right, you stay right here. And the preacher's able to, and while he's doing this, he gets a text message. All right, all right, guys, guys, I got you right here. All right, here's what we're going to do. All right, right, let me respond to this. All right, good, good. And then he put, and then he gets another text message, and he's holding these guys up. And then another church member comes. Come on, Hope, let's go make this sound. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, Brother Clint, I don't know what I'm going to do. He says, all right, I'll, I'll pray with you on that, and we'll make sure. And this is what your preacher, what does he do, just sit in an office all day? No, he's being gentle. You know what we need to fight sometimes as seasoned Christians? <laughs> Is that really what you're dealing with? Oh my goodness, that's so petty. Gentleness says, I'm so sorry, I understand. And as they help church member C get back and get going, and then church member B gets going, and with this, he's able to do this because he's strong. If he's not strong, thank you, Austin. If the preacher's not strong and the pastor is not doing it for godly reasons, it won't be long before he gets burned out. Because you can't be gentle with a weak hand. You have to be strong. And we went through all those verses in Joshua about be strong, be strong, be strong. Proverbs, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Husbands, that's why you need to walk with God so you can carry your wife and your kids without spazzing out. Gentleness, a strong hand with a gentle touch. Kind of like that coconut. It's tough. It's strong. Then we got to next, last week, we finish up the word goodness. Goodness. Now, what fruit do you think of when you say, man, that's good? Teenagers, which one do we use? Casey, a watermelon. A watermelon. 91% water, but here's the crazy part. It's all good. You can eat the melon. Anybody eat the seeds? A lot of us spit them out, but you can eat the seeds. Did, Did you ever have a watermelon grow in your belly? No? Amazing, isn't it? You can eat the seeds. Hey, you can eat the rind if you want to. Now, here's what many, I would never, then don't. That's more for the other people. You can eat it all, and it's fine. It's all good. So we use the watermelon of goodness. Now, in China and Japan, a watermelon's a popular gift to bring someone who's a host, and you're going to their house. That's a good thing to do. But what we learned about last week with goodness, because that's the word they used, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. There's a difference between being good and doing good. Doing good helps others. Being good helps others 
and it helps yourself. You have a clear conscience. You have a smile about your face. Any parent understands this, that you can tell your kids, you go over there right now and do it. Okay, fine. They're obeying. They're doing what you're telling them. They're doing a good thing. But if they are not doing it from within, goodness is the difference between having to and getting to. We've seen it, preacher. Bus workers who have to get up on Sunday, they don't last real long. Bus workers who get to work on the bus, they're in it forever. Brother Chris, junior church workers who have to go in there and have to try to settle these kids down and have to try to see if they're going to not talk during the preaching, they don't last real long. They get frustrated with every little thing. But we think it's our workers that we got in there that get to go in there, who put up with a little more than they should and probably express more love than they should justice, and that's, that's a problem I'm okay having. Why do they keep going back? Because they just have goodness inside of them that says, I'm going to do it. Jeff, working on those buses sure is worth the pay, isn't it? <clears throat> Here's the statement we hear told, not just in this, oh, they must have done that out of the goodness of their heart. What they don't know they're really saying is they were exuding a fruit of the Spirit. Goodness is the difference between having to and getting to. And so that brings us to our seventh fruit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. Are you there in Galatians chapter number 5? Before we read it together, the word is faith. And I always ask, teenagers, I always try to get to, was anybody musing on this this week? Any teenagers got a fruit they want to throw up, Brother Clint, that they think he might try to use this week? I already asked my daughter. She gave me one. We'll see if anyone else has one. What fruit would you associate with the word faith? Oh, you girls are laughing back there. What did Sarah say, Autumn? Did she say a good fruit? Cucumber. Ah, straight from Veggie Tales. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. It's not a cucumber. Anyone else? A grape. That's a good, Miss Pat, that ought to be worth something. But it ain't. That's our phrase at camp we use a lot when people have good ideas. Here we go. You ready? What? Faith? Peach. Gilbert, I literally thought you said beef. Beef is what's for dinner, all right? But you said peach. Did you say peach, Gilbert? Okay, that's incorrect, too. And uh, now, now, there's no incorrect. You use what you think it reminds you of, but here's what reminds me of faith. You ready? Brother Jerry, you're going to love this. A tomato. A tomato. A tomato has seeds and grows from a flowering plant, so botanically it is classified as a fruit and not a vegetable. Now all you farmers already knew that, so you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. But to the rest of us, that, I don't believe it. It don't taste like the rest of the fruit I like eating, right, Brother Jerry? Either do you. It's not sweet, it's not this. But the, so you know what it need, you know what I need to believe that a tomato is a fruit and not a vegetable? I need faith. <laughs> Cuz there's no logical reason I would believe that a tomato is a fruit. So I looked up other things about this that I need faith to believe. Would you believe that the most tomatoes harvested from one single plant over a year? But Lester weighed 1,151 pounds with 32,194 tomatoes harvested between May of 2005 and April of 2006. I don't believe it. It takes faith to believe that. A tomato's weight is 94% water. That's 3% more than a watermelon. I didn't believe it. But it takes faith. Would you believe the largest tomato weighed in 
in the Guinness Book of World Records at eight pounds, nine ounces. I don't believe it. Because it takes faith. Brother Greg, did you know the tomato is the state fruit of Ohio? What kind of Buckeye are you? <laughs> if you don't believe me, that's okay. It just takes faith. The tomato of faith. Father, tonight I need to be quick, and Lord, I'm already there, but would you help us to see this fruit of the Spirit, and may we please let it just grow out of our lives because of the relationship we have with you, the time we spend with you, the, 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 the singing we do with you, the walking, the talking, and as a result of being with Jesus, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and now faith, may it come out of our lives. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, the word we're going to look at here is faith. And I think it's interesting to note this, as our youth revival preacher, Brother, Daniel, uh, Brother Joseph Brown, mentioned in his message, about, and probably because I met this morning, uh, this evening with, uh, uh, I was discipling right before church, and our lesson was on the Word of God and, and the King James Bible. Uh, there's many versions out there, and how we believe that's the best copy that we've been given in English today and why we use it. I think it's neat to note this. Are you looking at Galatians 5, verse 22? Because as you're looking at it, your eyes follow along as I read it from another version which it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, we just want it to make sense to us. You follow along and tell me if it makes a big difference. I'm reading from another version where it says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. How are we doing? Are we okay so far? Sure we are. Let me keep reading. Forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. In this other version, we have a different word. Now, it's similar, but just because it's similar doesn't mean it's the same. When you guys go through a table line of a potluck meal, and you see different types of banana pudding, they're similar, but a lot of you always say this. Who made this one? Who made that one? Oh, okay, thank. And then you wait for people to walk away, and then they know that, okay. And then you go after the one that you, right? They're similar, but they're different. Faith and faithfulness are similar, but they are different. Well, then tell me, Brother Clint. I'm glad you asked. Here we go. Faith is a great trust or confidence in something or someone, Faithfulness is a quality of being faithful to something or someone. You can be faithful without exercising faith, but you cannot exercise faith without being faithful. What I'm saying is you can fake it. That's what we talked about last week about goodness. You can do good deeds, here, my mom told me I need to give this to you. There you go. I did a good deed. But that wasn't goodness. And, you know, there's a lot of people who by works are faithful and dedicated to certain things but don't exercise faith in doing that faithfulness. And so that's why it's important that we believe in the King James Version of the Bible, and that's just one of many, but you can be faithful without exercising faith, but you cannot express faith without being faithful. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But here's my favorite verse about faith, of why we need it in the Christian life, is Hebrews 11.6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Without faith... It is impossible to please him. If I had a dollar for every time I've used this statement in here, in teen church, in my Sunday school class, I'd have a lot of dollar bills. 
But when was the last time you did something in your life that required faith? Think about it. Well, we'll pay that bill because payday's coming up. No problem. Well, we'll take care of that because we're ready, and I'm good for that. But what is it in life that you're not just logically producing an explanation for and that you're stepping out on faith? Faith. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. Faith. And the more faith we exercise, the more faithful we become. How is faith expressed? It's expressed through faithfulness to God in faithfulness and reading God's word and church attendance and witnessing and service in obedience and giving. It's expressed through faithfulness to others. We're faithful at our places of employment. We're faithful in our friendships, in our relationships, in our marriage. We're, we're faithful in speaking the truth. We're faithful in the little things. Think about it. In what areas of life do you and I need to be more faithful, more stable, more reliable, and more dependable? Now, here's my main statement. Listen to this. I'm sure all of us want to hear the words of affirmation. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. But the answer is not in trying harder to become faithful. It's in exercising more faith. It's not in trying to be more faithful. I gotta, get, I gotta not just go to church Sunday morning, and I know we're the Wednesday night crowd, so just follow. Uh, it's not just showing up Sunday morning. It's, man, we really gotta work harder to go on Sunday nights, and, and if we can go Sunday morning and Sunday nights, maybe we'll be more faithful, and maybe once we get Sunday morning and Sunday night, then we can start coming on Wednesday night. We need to work on being more faithful. No, 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 what they need to work on is more faith. Because the reason they're not faithful now is because something is more important on Sunday night than attending church. And they have more faith that they have to take care of that thing instead of being at this property for 90 minutes on Sunday night, for about an hour and 20 minutes on Wednesday night. There's something they have more faith in for those directory of times than to be faithful in church. The goal isn't to work harder at becoming more faithful, more faithful. It's to believe and have more faith. The employee who loves his job doesn't have to work at being a more faithful employee. He's already there because he loves it. I worked with a guy at a steel factory in Glenwood, Illinois, Rayco Steel Company. He was amazing. His last name was Schweiger. We had a list of all the steel workers there. When I was in college, I was working there, and we were all with the newbies. We worked our ways because your name was over here based on your consecutive days at work. If you go 90 days without missing or calling off sick, you get a paid day off. If you go 120 days, they give you a voucher. You can get steel-toed boots from the company, and they'll pay for it. And at, 100, at 180 days, they'll give you a jacket and another voucher for boots. At two, and it goes on and on and on. Old Schweiger, man, he was at the top of the list over here, been working there. He had like 1,700 consecutive days. It was unbelievable. Wow, probably your best worker. You kidding me? That's the one everyone avoided. He'd come and clock in, eh, another day in paradise. <laughs> Three more years closer to retirement. <laughs> Nobody wanted to be around him, but I thought he was faithful. To him, it was just a job. And can I tell you, Christianity is more than just a job. It's more than just a chore. It's more than just a thing we do. And faithfulness is not the goal. Faith is the goal. So, 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 so we've seen what faith is and how, 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 it's, how it's expressed, but, but how do we develop it then? Because if we're not careful, we're going to work on all these externals, 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 and miss out on the internal of faith, 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 faith. Turn with me to the book of Judges. We're going to look at some examples here in Judges. First, go to Judges chapter 7. While you're there... 
Hebrews chapter 11 has a verse that's very good. Brother Eddie, pull Hebrews 11 up for me while they're turning to Judges. Hebrews chapter 11, and I want you to put verse 32 up there for me, Brother Eddie. And while you do that, we're going to look at something here in the book of Judges. All right, so we have Hebrews 11:32. In Hebrews 11 is the great hall of faith chapter, not the hall of fame, the hall of faith. And it lists all these uh, individuals who exercised and expressed their faith. And then after he explains through, through how Moses did this and how Abram did this and Jacob and Isaac and all these others, then he kind of just goes, man, in verse 32, and what shall I more say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and Jephthah and David also and Samuel and of the prophets. And he goes on and on and, and talks about those who were, who were thrown into coliseums with lions. I can't tell you about all those. And those who escaped the fires. I can't tell you about all those. And he just says, man, it's worth it to live by faith. It's worth it to live by faith. So as a result of reading that, I was wondering, what was he talking about when he says, what was it about Gideon? What was it about Barak? So, so we're going to go and see what it is from them, all right? You're in Judges chapter number 7, and, and uh, that's where we see the story of Gideon in a sense. But, but, but as I see this in Gideon's life, he's known for, I say his vision, but it's the vision God gave him. You with me? It's the same type of vision our pastor has for his church. It's not Brother White sitting back going, you know what I'd like to do? No, it's the Lord speaking to our pastor and him saying, hey, here's what our church needs to do. And he casts the vision that the Lord gives. And God was telling Gideon, man, thou mighty man of valor. Hey, I want to use you for this great thing. Hey, I want you to go forward. And Gideon's like, I don't know about this. He just didn't grasp the vision completely yet. Why? Probably because lack of faith. Where does faith come from? Fear. Judges chapter 7, look at verse number 9. I'm in Judges 4. Sorry. Judges 7, verse 9. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise and get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go with fury thy servant down to the host. And thou shalt hear what they say, and afterwards shall thine hands be strengthened to go down into the host. Then when he down with Fura, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were with him in the host, and the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number, and the sand of the sea Seaside for multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley uh, bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto the tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it, and the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon and of Joash, uh, a man of Israel, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and the host. And now because this man of vision was fearful, there was a Fura, a servant, that said, I'll go with you, Gideon. And Gideon went down and heard about this, and it solidified. And this servant enlightened his vision. It made it clear for him. It allowed him to see it like he'd never seen it before. And he decided to do what God commanded. All right, God said, I'm a mighty man of valor. I don't agree with that. God said, I'm going to lead this army of 30, no, not 32,000. Okay, 10,000, no, not 10,000, uh, 300. Are you serious? Okay, well, he says, we're going to win this battle. I don't think we can do it. I'm too scared. But there was a Fura who enlightened him and made him see you can express and develop more faith by just doing what God says. And you, exp you can develop your faith by doing what God says. And the more you read, the more you hear. The more you hear, the more you're required to obey. Which really is the reason I believe most people don't read the Bible. It's not because they don't understand it. They're afraid what it's going to tell them to do or not to do. You develop this faith by doing what God tells you to do. You, you develop faith. Go back to Judges chapter 4. There's another one. He said, right, go to Gideon, go to Barak. Judges chapter 4, we're going to see Barak was a man of valor who went into battle. 
He was a man of victory who won the battle because he developed, he believed God for the impossible. And Deborah, verse number four, and Deborah, a prophetess, she judged Israel at that time and she dwelt under the palm tree of, of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel uh, in the Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up for her to judgment. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded thee, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and the children of Zebulun? And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. And Barak said to her, uh, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding. The journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah rose and went with Barak. So this man was going to get the victory, but he said, You're not going to get the honor that comes with it. It's going to go to some woman. And he probably thought it was going to be her. And if you know anything, if you continue reading on, for time's sake, I'll just summarize. They go to battle, his 10,000 men against 900 chariots. A chariot back then was about three to five feet wide, held a, a, a person in charge of the horses, maybe two archers, three other foot soldiers on there. Anywhere from four to six men would be in that chariot. So yeah, you could say it's 10,000 foot soldiers against 900 chariots. They should win it. But really, the way the, the, the land was positioned, the chariots coming out, it really was a no-win situation. But Deborah, Deborah didn't enlighten him. Deborah said, hey, I'm going to encourage him. I'm going to help him to say, you can do this. So they go to battle and they flee and they take over and win this, except Sisera, the leader. It's interesting if you watch it. It's almost if my mind goes crazy Watch it. Sisera flees the battle. He goes to hide in some tent, Casey. And he goes, hey, lady, I need to hide in here. If anybody comes asking for me, tell them I'm not here. She goes, Aren't you Sisera? Yeah, yeah, that's me. Oh, well, she was, she was a Jew. And she says, wait, we don't like you people, right? And so she, here's what she does. She says, why don't you lay down right here? And she goes, I'll lay a towel over you. And the Bible plainly says that she drove a nail through his temples, a, 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 a nail from the tent, that spike that would go there. She said, you lay right here, okay. Waboom! And, man, he, and the Bible says he fastened into the ground, man. And, uh, and so as he did there, she then goes out and says, Hey, are you Barak? Yeah, I got Sisera in here. <laughs> Fulfilled the prophecy of Deborah in saying a woman will get your honor. Can you imagine that? We won the battle. You won the battle? I can't go to Mike's shop on Monday after that battle and win. So what would you do with that leader, Sisera? Me? <clears throat> Yeah, I, uh, we took care of him, Mike. Yeah, that's what we did. Oh, really? What did you do to him? Uh, me? I, uh, <clears throat> uh, my, uh, I had this lady. Uh, <laughs> she nailed him in the tent and, and put a spike through his, his temple for me, Mike. That, that, that's, I ain't going to Shadowland Motors and telling that story. He didn't get the honor for that. But he did get the honor for doing what seemed to be impossible. Not only was Gideon's 300 impossible against the Midianites, but this battle was impossible. You develop your faith by doing what God commands. You develop your faith, uh, secondly, by, by uh, 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 believing God for the impossible. For time's sake, I'll just say these, but they're also in Judges. Samson, he was known for picking himself up after a fail. Not all of us are perfect. We're human. We make mistakes. But our failures are never final. And Samson is an illustration of this, who after he had told Delilah where his strength lied and as he was with the wrong woman and did all this, his eyes were plucked out. The, the old outline from Samson's life is sin finds, sin binds, sin grinds. And that's where he was at the mill, grinding like an ox. But sin also reminds it reminds us that though we're in that sin, there is a Father who will forgive. Amen. And he went to those pillars and he said, revive me just this once. And he killed more in the day of his death than the days of his life. To remind us that our failures are not final. You can pick yourself up after a fall. 
And then lastly, we see here of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah. Go to Judges chapter 11. Jephthah is known for his vow. But what is it about faith that Jephthah showed? Judges chapter 11, it it's kind of starts as a sad story, and we don't have time to read through it. I'd encourage you to read it. Verse number one, now Jephthah, the Galadite, was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of an harlot. And Gildad begat Jephthah. And Gildad's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him, Thou shalt, shalt not inherit a father's house. And so we see this sad commentary that he's kicked out because he was an illegitimate child. And then all of a sudden, they were going to war. And they said, we need someone to lead us. Old Jephthah could do it. Well, you go ask him. So they went and asked Jephthah, would you lead us? And Jephthah said, well, if I win the battle, will you let me come back home? Basically what he says. And they said, okay, we'll do that. And so look what Jephthah does in verse 30 to make sure they win the battle. In verse 30 of chapter 11, and Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt withal fail, deliver the children of Amnon into mine hands. Then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Amnon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. And so they won the battle, and, and, uh, and all that. And look at verse 33. And he smote them from Aor, telling them where he went up, until the coming of the minute. And the twenty cities unto the plain of the vineyards and the great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him. God, when I come back to my house, the first thing I see I'll offer to you is a burnt offering. Verse 30, 36. And she said unto him, his daughter... My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. This young lady, his daughter, was used to ennoble him. We've heard of people encouraging, enlightening, and here, I don't think ennoble's a word. I made it up to go with the rest of my E words. But Jephthah is seen as a noble man who followed out through the vow he made to God. You know what this tells us? We should delight and desire God above all earthly ties. Now, here's what I don't want you to do. Don't put yourself in those shoes and say, man, I don't know if I could do that if I vowed that to God. Because to be honest, none of us probably have. But what is it in your life that takes precedence over God? If it was that third car you have, or the fifth car, do you desire that above the Lord? Is it that boat? Is it that fishing rod? Is it that tent? Is it that... Whatever it is that's taking your attention away from God. Tonight may be the night where you vow a vow to say, God, I want you to be my everything. Because that's where faith starts, with God. And when you solidify your faith, you can become faithful. Faith is to believe what you do not see. The reward of this faith is to see what you believe. That's the reward. Well, I want it now. I can't guarantee it's today. But I can guarantee you will see it. For those of you who have faith in God to take you to heaven, you will see it someday, but I can't guarantee it today. Might be tomorrow. Might be next week. Might be next year. Might be in the next five minutes. I don't know. But I know you will see it. And I know that those of you who serve and faithfully and, and, and exercise that faith, you're trusting in a big reward in the, in the great judgment seat of Christ and all that, and that's good. I can't guarantee it, but I know it's going to happen. The, to the one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. To the one without faith, no explanation is possible. 
I believe the church should do this. Amen, we're for it. That means you have faith that your pastor has walked with God to get a vision from God that's leading our church to do this for God. Amen. To those who are like, oh, I don't know about, you know what? Any explanation we give ain't going to work because it must take faith. Love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. How's your faith tonight? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Living in the Spirit brings the fruit of faith, and that faith is evidenced by a faithful life. Remember, the goal isn't faithfulness. The goal is faith. And if your goal is faith, the result will be faithfulness. You develop that faith, it's evidenced by doing what God commands, by believing God for the impossible, by picking yourself out after a fall, and by desiring God above all earthly ties. God may not be asking you to sacrifice a child, but mom and dad, God may be asking you to allow him to take your child wherever he wants him to go or her to go. He may not be asking for a burnt sacrifice. He may be asking for a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. I pray as parents we never get to the point to where we hold our kids back. I've seen it too much in this area that we live in. Mom and dad live here, and their three kids live on the rest of the acreage that he's purchased through his hard work and living through the years. And they used to do this in the church, and their daughter used to do that in the church, and their son used to do this in the church, but they all lived together on that property, and they got their house on their four acres, and they got their house on their four acres, and they got their house, and we're all together for Mother's Day, and we're all together. We're all together, but we're also individually outside the will of God. God's not asking you to kill your child or sacrifice him. He's just asking if you'll let him give him back to him. Desiring him above all earthly pleasures.